welcome back. Today we will embark on a multi-series lecture on memory. The first uh, installment today is entitled Memories are made of this, part one. How a psychiatrist hacked the memory code. We have revised our format a bit. Uh, rather than having a typical lecture with slides and the exposition of science, we will approach a little more of a, a style of a documentary slash um, uh, entertainment slash biography uh, to highlight the lives of the scientists that are involved in this research to bring things a little closer to you and give you a more um, elementary feel as to why scientists do what they do and what their motivations really are sometimes. So today we begin with Dr. Eric Kendall, who really cracked the memory code and believe it or not, he's still at it. He's now, I believe, 86 years old as of the recording of this video here. And he is still at Columbia University in New York, plugging away at some um, revolutionary new findings that uh, he is working on. Now, Dr. Kandel comes from Europe. Specifically, he was born in Vienna, Austria, and he had to escape. Uh, fortunately, his parents were wise enough to leave early enough in uh, 1939 or so, uh, escape uh, Nazi Germany and the annexation of Austria into the so-called Reich. And uh, he was shipped with his older brother on a train and then on a boat to New York City. Uh, his uh, grandparents on one side of the family and some uncles already were in the U.S. and his parents, fortunately, were able to join him later. Now, he vividly recalls uh, Kristallnacht, which is the night where Nazi uh, thugs destroyed Jewish uh, businesses all over Vienna, uh, set the synagogues on fire and, uh, and um, did uh, other unspeakable acts against the Jewish communi uh, community, which happened in Vienna for a long period of time and had been fully integrated into the Viennese culture, albeit um, anti-Semitism in Austria was always a very important force. Well, Dr. Kandel vividly remembers these days, and it has become one of the driving forces for his exploration of memory. How do we remember? What do we remember? What is the uh, power of traumatic memories, specifically? So when he enrolled at Harvard College um, after high school, uh, he wanted to study European history and literature to try to understand why people who on one day listened to Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven, the next day would destroy and kill members of their own community. He took a, a fellowship, a brief fellowship, at uh, the National Institute of Health telling uh, his lab supervisor that he wanted to understand memory at the brain level. His supervisor laughed and said, well, you know, the way you understand the brain is one cell at a time. Now, at that time, the young Dr. Kandel was already heavily influenced and involved in psychoanalysis, which was the other uh, discipline attempting to understand the nature of memory and how to use recovery of memory for healing purposes. And of course, um, Dr. Freud, Sigmund Freud, also from Vienna, another psychiatrist from Vienna and trying to understand memory, had escaped to England also to get away from Nazi persecution and almost certain death. So here you have then two psychiatrists. And interestingly, as I will show you in a minute, Dr. Freud, already in a very prescient way, um, put down some sketches on paper which would foreshadow the later discovery of neurons, the synaptic cleft, and neuronal regulation. However, at the time when Freud lived, 
there was no scientific methodology to approach this three pound or so um, hunk of flesh in your skull to understand the uh, incredible complexity of brain structure. Now when Dr. Kandel came along in the 1950s, the methodology was just emerging. And so he um, overcame his infatuation, I guess, in a sense, with psychoanalysis, enrolled in cell biology, molecular biology, and all the tools that you really need to push neuroscience forward. And he is the one who put the first cracks into the wall of understanding how memory works, not just in man, but in simple organisms as well. So in the first slide, um, I show you some of his writing here. So he has he says that uh, after some initial attempts to go directly to a mouse model of memory or other rodents, that it was impossible to deal with the complexity of, for example, the hippocampal neuro wiring diagram in rodents and deduce anything about memory. So he made a evolutionary and rather revolutionary leap of faith. And he writes, I therefore have been curious to know what changes in the brain occur when we learn. And when something is learned, how is the information retained in the brain? I've tried to address these questions through a reductionist approach that would allow me to investigate elementary forms of learning and memory at a cellular molecular level as specific molecular activities within identified nerve cells. And he continues, it was my belief that concerns about the use of a simple experimental system to study learning were misplaced. If elementary forms of learning are common to all animals with an involved nervous system, there must be conserved features in the mechanisms of learning at the cell and molecular level that can be studied effectively even in simple invertebrate animals. So this was his leap of faith. Let's go to a very simple organism with a very simplified nervous system and study simple forms of memory and believing in the evolutionary conservation of key invention in cell biology, we can probably transpose these findings in some important way to the study of vertebrates, mammals, and eventually man. Next slide shows you um, a URL, and I'd like for you now to watch a brief video that introduces Dr. Kandel. He's quite a personality very charming, uh, very uh, plain spoken, very clear, very incisive. And he will talk to you about his belief in using a simple organism and uh, uh, building on evolutionary conservation and then transposing the findings to the study of higher mammals. So I'll see you back on the other side of the video, which I think you will find quite enjoyable. See you soon. Mind to brain, but soon concluded that the tools available were inadequate for addressing the complexities of the human mind in biological terms. The field of psychoanalysis was the result. Kandel, early in his career, after receiving psychoanalytic training, embraced the brain because he felt neuroscience was ready to tackle the mind. Indeed, modern neuroscience has achieved what Freud had dreamed of, the beginnings of a map of the mind and the brain. And Eric Kandel has been a pioneer in this effort. In my opinion, history will describe neuroscience of the late 20th century and early 21st century as the Eric Kandel era. Eric, let's go back to the late 1950s. You were a psychiatrist, but you were also passionate about research. And of all the topics you could have chosen to study, you picked memory. What led you to that decision? Well, uh... As you indicated in your very generous introduction, um, I was very much interested in psychoanalysis and thought for the longest time of becoming a psychoanalyst. 
And when I was given the opportunity um, to go to the NIH, um, the head of my lab essentially said, uh, what problem would you like to work on? And gave me complete freedom. And I thought, what's the central problem in psychoanalysis? Um, and I came to the conclusion that certainly a central problem is memory. We are who we are in large part of what we learn and what we remember. And psychoanalysis is an attempt to relive certain painful memories in a protected environment and to work them through and master them. Uh, so I thought understanding memory would be quite wonderful. And the task was enriched for me even more by the fact that just as I was beginning to think about this problem, um, Brenda Milner had just recently discovered that the hippocampus, a structure deep in the temporal lobe, is a critical site for a major class of memory storage. So I thought that studying the hippocampus would be a wonderful beginning for understanding memory. So how did you get started on this hippocampal project? I was fortunate to team up with another young colleague who also was at the NIH to train in science. And um, I showed him this dissection I developed of the hippocampus, which was just marvelous to look at. And he agreed that this was a beautiful preparation. We joined forces, it was all in Spencer. We had a fabulous collaboration. And we were the first people to record from hippocampal neurons um, intracellularly. And I cannot tell you the excitement this caused on the floor we worked on at the NIH, many different laboratories. Here, two incompetent young people coming to the NIH and coming up with a nice piece of science. And we spent the next two years studying in detail the cellular properties of hippocampal neurons. Why did you turn from the hippocampus of mammals, which would obviously be very relevant to human memory, to the nervous system of a sea slug, which is so far removed from the human brain? Everyone was very excited, and we turned to ourselves and we said, what have we learned about memory storage? And we realized we'd learned very little. So I thought I would take a simple form of learning in a simple animal and try to drive it into the ground. And since my tool was recording from single cells, I wanted to have an animal that had gigantic nerve cells. And people were coming through the NIH giving seminars. It was really the place for neuroscience in those days. And both Ladislav Tork and Angelique Avanitaki the only two people in the world working on a plisia, the snail, came through. And I realized these were the largest nerve cells in the animal kingdom, and they were just made for me, made to order. I first entered the world of neuroscience in the mid-1970s, and at that time, your discoveries about the mechanisms that underlie learning in the plesia were already making big headlines. I was immersed in, uh, in cognitive psychology at that point, and it was uh, sort of common at that time to hear people say something like, well, Kandel has understood a lot about learning in a very simple organism. Um, who cares? Yeah, who cares? What does that have to do with memory? But I think your work has put these criticisms to rest. Do you tell us about how basic mechanisms in an animal so simple and so far from our evolutionary history has shed light on the human mind? What you said was, was a common reaction, and Jack Eccles, who was one of the leaders in neuroscience, said I was throwing my career away, leaving the hippocampus to go for a plesia. So I thought that one needed to take a reductionist strategy to learning as one did to all aspects of biology, that insofar as you identify a mechanism of a general process, it's likely to be conserved in evolution and used time and time again. It might not be used in identical form, it may be varied a little bit, but the principles would be the same. So I went to a very simple animal with a very simple nervous system to see whether or not one can train it to learn something, and I found you could do that. Because it was so simple, I was able to work out the neural circuitry of the reflex and then see what happens to that reflex when it's modified by learning. We knew from Pavlov and Thorndike um, that they were simple learning tasks that you could teach even to a very simple animal. So I explored habituation, sensitization, classical conditioning, and subsequently other people studied operant conditioning um, of this simple behavior that I isolated. And I was able to show that uh, what learning does is alter the strength of synaptic connections, how nerve cells communicate with one another. 
And I found that in short-term memory, there's an alteration in how cells talk to each other and the strength of synaptic connections. Um, but there's not an anatomical change. With long-term memory, there's an alteration in gene expression and there's an actual growth of new synaptic connections. So as I like to tell my students, if you remember anything about this conversation, you will have a slightly different brain after the conversation than you had beforehand. And I really thought this was extremely interesting from a psychotherapeutic point of view, which I pointed out, which was obvious to me, but was not obvious to most analysts, that insofar as psychotherapy works and produces persistent changes in someone's brain, it must be producing anatomical changes. And as we know from Helen Mayberg, people have done imaging outcome of psychotherapy. We can actually detect changes in brain function and structure as a result of psychotherapy. I think you'd probably uh, agree with this statement, that particularly important in the relationship between invertebrate and human memory, including memories that are established through psychotherapy, is the fact that the molecules involved in creating and sustaining the synaptic connections that underlie memory are conserved across species. Would you mind giving us a quick tour of what's involved? So uh, once we were able to define the cellular physiology, um, we were able to ask the question, what are the molecules that underlie these changes? Long-term memory involves gene expression, which involves a critical activate of gene expression called CREB, cyclic game P response element binding protein. Um, that turned out to be critical in the placebo. If you remove it, you don't have any long-term memory. It turns out to have a similar role in learned fear in the mouse, as you showed, um, and in spatial memory, explicit memory, in the hippocampus. Um, almost every memory process that has been looked at uses CREB as one of its components. There may often have additional components, but the quorkum machinery is there. And that is gratifying to some degree, but not at all surprising. I think it's sometimes overlooked how fundamental the approach that you took was. You first asked a simple question, what is it that's learned? Then you asked, where does the learning take place? And then, where are the key cells and synapses that change? Finally, what molecules make these changes possible? In other words, what, where, and how? Today, everyone in neuroscience studying behavior follows this approach. I don't think it would be so commonplace if you hadn't made it so explicit and been so successful with it by using a simple behavior in a simple organism with a simple nervous system. You're very generous. I'm not sure the field would not have done. Uh, it, it, to me, it was sort of obvious. Um, and certainly, this is exactly the path you followed. But I followed you. I think you would have done it even without me. Um, we both came from a tradition in which behavior was greatly respected. Cognitive psychology on the one hand and psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis was a precursor of cognitive psychology. Um, and um, I think that's the key step. Many people were reluctant to study behavior because they thought as biologists they wouldn't know how to do it. And I was not frightened of that. Also, I was very fortunate. I recruited Irving Kupferman and Tom Carew, very gifted behaviorists, to work with me. They had not worked on snails before, but they realized you could shift over very easily. And so I learned a great deal from them. Um, and then I had been trained as a cellular biologist. Working out the neural circuitry was what I was doing, uh, looking at the connections. And then biochemistry came along, and molecular biology, also the field was evolving. So tools that made it easy to explore the molecular underpinnings came along. So I was also fortunate in the period in which I came along. The problems were opening up and the techniques were coming available. But you codified the approach. You're very nice to say that. I'm sure it would have occurred without me. <laughs> in recent years, through your work on mice, you've begun to ask questions that go beyond memory. You're looking at the mechanisms of attention and cognition, seeking answers to consciousness itself. What's your vision for the future of our field? How far can we go in our quest to map the mind and the brain? Biologists, as you and I both know because we share the sentiment, are delusional optimists. So I don't see any brick wall at the moment that prevents neuroscience from solving really all the challenges ahead. Okay, welcome back. 
So you have seen Dr. Kandel expose his ideas on how to approach memory by using a simple model system. But I couldn't let this go and go on before introducing you to his uh, scientific precursor, Dr. Sigmund Freud. And you see him here, his iconic image, smoking a cigar. Uh, cigars, in the end, did him in. He uh, died of uh, oral cancer, unfortunately. Uh, he was never able to quit cigars. Um, he also had a history of using cocaine in his younger years quite extensively. And nicotine and cocaine, of course, tap into the same reward system in the brain. So he wrote a monograph on cocaine, which became quite important, for example. He um, invented the use of cocaine as an anesthetic in eye surgery. However, he was too preoccupied with uh, pursuing his uh, fiance at the time to get it published, and uh, someone else published it and won the Nobel Prize for it. Be that as it may, on the right-hand side here of Dr. Freud's photo, you see a sketch. And you see different elements uh, linking to each other, interrupted by bars with an empty space inside. And this is an anticipation of the neurons that interact with each other, as well as the synapse, which has an open space in the middle. And on the right-hand side, you see his distinctive handwriting, where he puts down his ideas on the so-called project, the project being to create a foundation of a psychodynamic understanding of the mind or psychoanalysis in neuronal terms. Of course, his project was doomed from the beginning because the methodology to go any further was just not available. Although it should be mentioned in passing that Freud was an excellent neuroanatomist and uh, did uh, excellent drawing of certain uh, neuronal system in uh, lower animals. Next slide, please. So this then is the organism that um, Dr. Kandel settled on, a plusia. Now this is a invertebrate, so there are no bones in this uh, animal. It's just a gooey mass of cells but it has evolved certain mechanisms to protect his breathing apparatus, which you cannot see because it's kind of on the underside. And uh, this um, apparatus is protected by a reflex arc and a simple learning system that Dr. Kandel chose to study. The other reason he chose aplusia, as he pointed out to you in the video, is that, uh, next slide, Aplusia only has about 20,000 neurons. Man has 100 billion neurons. So there's a substantial factor of reduction in complexity. Uh, the other advantage of aplusia is that the nerve cells are humongously big. You can see them always with the naked eye, and you can stick electrodes into them and record from them repeatedly without destroying the nerve cell. So this then was the ideal model system, also, or so Dr. Kandel thought, to elucidate the first steps of memory. Now, many of his colleagues were extremely skeptical and warned him that he would be throwing away his career if he were to study so-called memory in this uh, very simple uh, system. He proved them totally wrong. And eventually, in 2000, in the year 2000, won the Nobel Prize for Medicine and Physiology for exactly this work in aplusia and other studies. Next slide. So here, then, is this organism. And you see the underside, some of the um, anatomical features. What we are talking about is the gill withdrawal reflex. So the gill is the breathing machine that aplusia is using. And it's a siphon which, when touched by a stimulus, will trigger the withdrawal and cover-up of the gill itself. Now, he discovered that you can sensitize this reflex to higher intensity. In other words, more intense withdrawal of the gill if you applied a noxious stimulus to the tail of the animal before touching the siphon and that is known as sensitization. 
Um, the other aspect that is also implemented in aplasia is habituation. If you apply a stimulus a number of times, the organism gets bored, or the neural circuit kind of gets bored, and the response attenuates and gets smaller and smaller over time. So we have simple reflex learning, we have sensitization, and we have habituation. All three are components which are also found in vertebrate animals and in man. So as, to, as Dr. Kandel was saying in one of the videos, if you are exposed to a loud gunshot and five minutes later somebody taps you on the shoulder, you will have an exaggerated response to being tapped on the shoulder because your nervous system is now sensitized to other incoming stimuli. And the right hand side of the panel you see what happens when you stimulate the siphon multiple times, four trains in four days, and you can see that the duration of the withdrawal of the gill reflex uh, is uh, um, markedly increased and lasts for days after the last stimulation has been applied. So this then is an element of retained learning. The uh, information, whatever the biochemistry was, encoding this information is still present after seven days. Okay, the next slide uh, shows you the URL to a short video in which Dr. Kandel actually demonstrates on a living animal how the gill reflex functions. So I'll see you back at the other side of this uh, brief video. So we're looking at a, an aplysia stretched out. We're going to focus in on the gill and the siphon. We're going to apply an extremely weak stimulus so you can see the amplification with sensitization. Weak stimulus to the siphon, you see a modest withdrawal of the gill. Now we're going to frighten the animal, startle it, give a noxious stimulus to the tail. That, of course, causes a contraction in its own right. This contraction lasts for seconds, but you can come back minutes later. The same siphon stimulus now produces a much more powerful withdrawal. We can now compare the two, normal and sensitized, and see how much more powerful the withdrawal is in the animal that is startled. The memory for this event is a function of number of training trials. So if you give a single tail shock, plotting here, change in reflex strength is a function of time. The enhancement for, of the reflex lasts minutes. But if we give the same stimulus four or five times, we get a memory that lasts a couple of days. So we have a short-term memory and a long-term memory, and we can now look at the difference between them. All right, welcome back. So you saw Dr. Kendall demonstrate how you can elicit the gill reflex in aplusia. So here now is a drawing of the gill reflex uh, arc and the ganglion in which these nerve cells are incorporated. And as you can see, the blue cells are the sensory cells that encode the sensory tactile information coming from the siphon. There is a uh, direct link to the L7 motor neuron which then goes to the gill and leads to the contraction and withdrawal of the structure. And in panel B at the bottom, and again in the next slide, you can see that uh, the motor neuron fires and the gill reflex is initiated on the left-hand side of panel B. In the middle, you can see the correlation or the conjunction of the sensory neuron responding to stimulation and the motor neuron firing and action potential. And on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see multiple sensory neurons firing, multiple motor neurons responding, and an enhanced gill reflex. So that's the setup. Uh, deceptively simple, and if pursued to the nth degree, and um, that is what Dr. Kenda does. He pursues things to the nth degree to figure out the last detail. And that kind of approach was extremely successful, as you will see in the next few slides. Next slide. 
So this then is the wiring diagram that he and his colleagues elucidated. There are in all 24 sensory neurons that connect to a total of six motor neurons that impinge on the gill. Now there are some interneurons here and these are really very powerful computing and integrating tools. Remarkably, some of these interneurons use serotonin as a neurotransmitter. And as you know, serotonin is in your brain, and serotonin is that system that most of the antidepressant medications that man takes in the 21st century talk to the serotonin system. So here you are, uh, 500 or 600 million years back in evolution, prior to the emergence of vertebrates and far prior to the emergence of mammals, you can see a serotonin system already in action, modulating a circuit uh, consisting of a sensory input and a motor output. So that is what, what is meant by evolutionary conservation. So Dr. Kendall's intuition proved correct that these systems are conserved over deep evolutionary times and his bet to study an early precursor of these systems, uh, believing that it can be applicable to us now, totally paid off. Next slide. So the connections between these cells are stunningly invariant. That's why he is counting these cells. 24 sensory cells, seven motor cells, so if the number of cells is always the same, how do you modulate the strength of the response? Why is it that if you stimulate a number of times, you get more withdrawal in the gill reflex uh, compared to only a single train of stimulation? So if it's not the number of cells recruited for this event, then it must be the strength of the biochemistry or the intensity of the response within each single neuron. So that was the starting point. What is changing in response to repeated stimulation? What are the biochemical signals that would allow the neuron to enhance its output capacity and drive this reflex in a stronger fashion? Next slide. So here is a um, quick anticipation of the various components you see and you're already familiar with the uh, sensory modulatory neuron here on the right hand side. Uh, using serotonin and you see here the motor neuron imp impinging on the gill muscle. Now here in the middle of the panel you get a first hint of the events to come, namely there is a molecule called cyclic AMP, which is um, made by an enzyme um, that utilizes uh, the ATP molecule um, to uh, reconstruct itself into a second messenger. Cyclic AMP binds to a protein called protein kinase. Now, protein kinases have made an appearance in our lecture scheduled a number of times namely when we discuss the glutamine neuron. A protein kinase is an enzyme which takes a phosphate, a highly negative charge um, group, a molecule, uh, from ATP and sticks it onto a protein. This is called covalent modification. This protein is now not the same anymore. Its uh, biophysical properties have changed. Uh, if it is an enzyme, it may be much more effective or much less effective. If it is a um, receptor in a membrane, it may change conformation and either bind its ligand more or less uh, efficiently. So this is the modification of proteins pre-existing in the cell as a means to quickly respond to a trigger from the environment. Next slide. So here then is the total package. Let's review. So we have um, the tail here, which we have seen uh, will sensitize the response produced uh, in the gill by the motor neuron. 
This is mediated by serotonin or 5-HT and uh, coupled to a G protein receptor leads to the accumulation of this molecule cyclic AMP. Now I put it on a red box for you here and you can see the symbol PKA as protein kinase A. So protein kinase A can then quickly facilitate certain effects in the neuron to make the next neuronal response more efficient. For example, uh, providing that more um, vesicles are available for enhanced transmitter availability or release. Now on the further side down the road, you see the first elucidation of what happens when you stimulate multiple times and you get this persistent increased responsiveness of the system. And that has to do with gene activation. So the neuron now begins to talk to its genes to turn on certain genes as is, as is inter integrating information from the environment. The neurons begin to notice that here is increased demand. We need to really adjust our way of doing business. And this adjustment requires protein synthesis. In order to get this going, you need to send a signal to the nucleus, and that is called MAP kinase here. Uh, the uh, protein kinase uh, is translocated into the nucleus, binds to a cyclic AMP responsive element, CREB. And you can see there are early genes and late genes. Uh, the early genes lead to the production of an enzyme called ubiquitin hydrolase, which destroys the regulatory subunit of protein kinase. In other words, it leads to the accumulation of the catalytic active subunit of protein kinase, leading to more and more phosphorylation activity. So it's like a positive feedback loop. So a very efficient and quick uh, response. Later genes that are also induced will lead to other changes that we will discuss later, such as dendritic sprouting, uh, making new synapses, and a whole scale uh, anatomical reorganization of the, system, of the system in response to increased demand. The next slide. Now, I couldn't help myself but to include a, an article that I was involved with at Stanford. Now, this was also in the 1970s. So this was about the time when Dr. Kandel and many researchers uh, across the U.S. became preoccupied with cyclic AMP as well as protein kinases. It was a very hot topic. It became evident that protein phosphorylation played a key role in many important metabolic regulatory functions in the cell and in particular in the nervous system. So our group at Stanford discovered that tyrosine hydroxylase, which is the enzyme that is involved in the synthesis of dopamine, could be dramatically increased in activity by phosphorylation by cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase. So I couldn't help myself but insert this here so you can understand I have a certain affinity for the cyclic AMP molecule and for the very idea of a covalent uh, protein phosphorylation and regulation in the nervous system. But let's go on to the next slide. So here's another feature that Dr. Kendall discovered, and it is called capture. So at the top panel A, you see a um, sensory cell in the uh, in a dish, in tissue culture, uh, surgically removed from the aplysia animal. And this will be the cell right there. And you can see dendrites of this cell in either direction go to the motor neuron. Now, what happens when you stimulate the sensory cell and you have a sensory cell connected to two motor neurons at the same time? 
Do they both get turned on at the same time? Do we potentiate and facilitate both motor neurons at the same time? Well, no. Only one gets activated with one exception. If you apply a single puff of serotonin to the second motor neuron, this will prime this neuron to also be, be enhanced by the sensory neuron input. And the way this works, and the only way we can imagine it works, is if the protein synthesizing machinery somehow gets transported through the axon of the sensory neuron into the motor neuron. So there is a wholesale importation of protein synthesis apparatus into the motor neuron. So this is a phenomenon known as capture, and uh, it was one of the major discoveries um, elucidating how the wiring of these systems is modulated. Next slide. And here it's illustrated in some more detail. So you see that two effects of short-term facilitization, short-term memory storage when acting by itself and marking of the specific synapse to which it is applied for subsequent capture of the proteins necessary for long-term facilitation and growth when applied in conjunction with five pulses to another set of terminals. So basically what it means is you can pre-program which cell will be impacted by the, uh, in, by the information coming from the sensory neuron. It's a way to fine-tune a signal and amplify it as the need arises. Next slide. So here then are all the different aspects combined in one sketch. So there are a number of consequences when a transmitter is released onto one of these cells. Number one is there is a rapid ligand gated ion channel that leads to rapid synaptic action lasting only milliseconds. And the second effect is in number two, transmitter activation of a transmembrane protein, a G protein for the most part, leads to an enduring synaptic action lasting four minutes. Now third, repeated transmitter activation of the G protein leads to translocation of the protein kinase into the nucleus of the cell, producing a persistent synaptic action. And finally, number four, transmitter activation of local protein synthesis can be triggered to stabilize synapse-specific facilitation. Here it is. This is the whole shooting match. And all this was worked out in Aplusia by Dr. Kandel. And believe it or not, all the same principles, of course, apply in rodents and in man. That is the power of evolution over the course of 600 million years or more. Next slide. Okay, we will now go to a brief video, which uh, is a very elegant description of the process of sensitization in Aplusia. It will go over the same territory uh, that we have covered so far um, in a slightly different way. And uh, if one principle of learning is true, it's repetition is very important. So please enjoy and, um, and accept some repetition of this material so you can learn in a more deep way. I see you at the other side of this video. Synapses exhibit many forms of plasticity that occur over a broad temporal range, from seconds to minutes to hours, days, or even years. Many synapses exhibit long-lasting forms of plasticity that are manifested by molecular or structural changes. These changes may represent more permanent changes in brain function and contribute to learning and memory. One strategy for finding out how the nervous system is changed by a specific learning task is to exploit the relative simplicity of the CNS of some invertebrates. Eric Kandel and his colleagues at Columbia University 
used the marine mollusk Aplysia californica to study the elemental forms of behavioral and synaptic plasticity. Aplysia exhibits several forms of behavioral plasticity. For example, applying a tactile stimulus to the siphon of an aplysia results in withdrawal of the animal's gill, but repeated siphon stimulation causes the gill withdrawal to weaken. The process that causes an animal to become less responsive to repeated occurrences of a stimulus is called habituation. The gill withdrawal response also exhibits a form of plasticity called sensitization. In aplysia that have habituated to siphon touching, a strong electrical stimulus to the tail, paired with a light touch of the siphon, elicits a strong gill withdrawal, as if the animal had not been habituated. Sensitization allows an animal to generalize an aversive response elicited by a noxious stimulus to a variety of other non-noxious stimuli. This graph shows the habituation of the gill withdrawal reflex following repeated stimulation of the siphon. In an aplysia that receives a single stimulus to the tail, the gill withdrawal reflex remains enhanced for about an hour. With repeated pairing of tail and siphon stimuli, this behavior can be altered for days or weeks, demonstrating a simple form of long-term memory. Whereas four single tail shocks sensitize the gill withdrawal response for a short time, repeated tail shocks for several days causes prolonged sensitization of the gill withdrawal response. The small number of neurons in the aplysia nervous system makes it possible to define the synaptic circuits involved in gill withdrawal and to monitor the activity of individual neurons and synapses in these circuits. For example, the cell bodies of many of the neurons involved in gill withdrawal can be recognized by their size, shape, and position within the abdominal ganglion. Although hundreds of neurons are ultimately involved in producing this simple behavior, the activities of only a few different types of neurons can account for gill withdrawal during habituation and sensitization. These critical neurons include sensory neurons that innervate the siphon, motor neurons that innervate muscles in the gill, and interneurons that receive inputs from a variety of sensory neurons. Touching the siphon activates the sensory neurons, which form excitatory synapses that release glutamate onto both the interneurons and the motor neurons. By monitoring the electrical activity of the neurons, we can see the effect that touching the siphon has on both these postsynaptic targets. Both habituation and sensitization appear to arise from plastic changes in synaptic transmission in this circuit. During habituation, transmission at the glutamatergic synapse between the sensory and motor neurons is depressed. This synaptic depression is thought to be responsible for the decreasing ability of siphon stimuli to evoke gill contractions during habituation. This depression is presynaptic and is due to a reduction in the number of synaptic vesicles available for release. As we will see, sensitization modifies the function of this circuit by activating modulatory interneurons. The tail shock that evokes sensitization activates sensory neurons that innervate the tail. These sensory neurons in turn excite modulatory interneurons that release serotonin onto the presynaptic terminals of the sensory neurons of the siphon. Serotonin enhances transmitter release from the siphon sensory neuron terminals, leading to increased synaptic excitation of the motor neurons. Now, a light touch on the siphon can again elicit a strong gill withdrawal response. Note that the modulation of the sensory neuron motor neuron synapse lasts approximately an hour, which is similar to the duration of the short term sensitization of gill withdrawal produced by applying a single shock to the tail. Let's explore the biochemical mechanisms thought to be responsible for the enhancement of glutamatergic transmission during short-term sensitization. Serotonin released by the facilitatory interneurons binds to G-protein coupled serotonin receptors on the presynaptic terminals of the siphon sensory neurons, activating the G-protein. The activated G protein dissociates from the receptor and binds to and activates other signaling molecules such as the enzyme adenylyl cyclase. 
This enzyme stimulates production of the second messenger cyclic AMP from ATP. The cyclic AMP molecules bind to the regulatory subunits of protein kinase A, abbreviated PKA, liberating catalytic subunits of PKA that are then able to phosphorylate several proteins, including potassium channels. When a sensory neuron synapse is depolarized, calcium channels open and calcium ions enter the terminal. Phosphorylation of potassium channels by PKA results in fewer open potassium channels, thereby prolonging the duration of the depolarization and increasing the influx of calcium. The enhanced influx of calcium, in turn, results in more neurotransmitter being released. In summary, short-term sensitization of gill withdrawal is mediated by a signal transduction cascade that involves neurotransmitters, second messengers, one or more protein kinases, and ion channels. This cascade ultimately enhances synaptic transmission between the sensory and motor neurons within the gill withdrawal circuit. The same serotonin-induced enhancement of glutamate release that mediates short-term sensitization is also thought to underlie long-term sensitization. However, during long-term sensitization, this circuitry is affected for up to several weeks. The prolonged duration of this form of plasticity is evidently due to changes in gene expression and thus protein synthesis. With repeated training, that is, additional tail shocks, the serotonin-activated PKA involved in short-term sensitization now also phosphorylates and thereby activates the transcriptional activator cyclic AMP response element binding protein, or CREB. CREB binding to the cyclic AMP response elements, or CREs, in regulatory regions of nuclear DNA increases the rate of transcription of downstream genes. Although the changes in genes and gene products that follow Cree activation have been difficult to sort out, several consequences of gene activation have been identified. First, CREB stimulates the synthesis of an enzyme, ubiquitin hydroxylase. CREB also activates the gene that encodes another protein called CEPB. Ubiquitin hydroxylase stimulates degradation of the regulatory subunit of PKA. This causes a persistent increase in the amount of free catalytic subunit, meaning that some PKA is persistently active and no longer requires serotonin to be activated. Like CREB, CEPB is a transcription factor that stimulates transcription of other unknown genes. The gene products result in the production of proteins that cause addition of synaptic terminals, yielding a long-term increase in the number of synapses between the sensory and the motor neurons. Such structural increases are not seen following short-term sensitization and may represent the ultimate cause of the long-lasting change in overall strength of the relevant circuit connections that produce a long-lasting enhancement in the gill withdrawal response. It is thought that similar mechanisms may underlie the synaptic changes that account for long-term memories in humans. Okay, now that you have known about Apusia and Dr. Kandel's big gamble, which paid off, um, I want you to know that when Dr. Kandel turned 60, he changed path again. He now abandoned basically Apusia and went into the hippocampus. Now that is a late start for a scientist being 60 years of age, but in typical fashion, he revolutionized that field, of course, as well. Why the hippocampus? Well, instead of me telling you the story, there's a very intriguing um, cartoon here, animated cartoon, that tells you the story of patient H. M. This unfortunate man had surgery for intractable seizures and wound up with a very profound impairment of memory. Uh, the gift of HM to us is that he is the most studied memory patient in history and we owe it to him that we got on the right track in uh, studying the hippocampus uh, in the role of memory. So please look at this video and I'll see you back on the other side of this video.
On September 1, 1953, William Scoville used a hand crank and a cheap drill saw to bore into a young man's skull, cutting away vital pieces of his brain and sucking them out through a metal tube. But this wasn't a scene from a horror film or a gruesome police report. Dr. Scoville was one of the most renowned neurosurgeons of his time, and the young man was Henry Malayson, the famous patient known as H.M., whose case provided amazing insights into how our brains work. As a boy, Henry had cracked his skull in an accident and soon began having seizures, blacking out, and losing control of bodily functions. After enduring years of frequent episodes and even dropping out of high school, the desperate young man had turned to Dr. Scoville, a daredevil known for risky surgeries. Partial lobotomies had been used for decades to treat mental patients, based on the notion that mental functions were strictly localized to corresponding brain areas. Having successfully used them to reduce seizures in psychotics, Scoville decided to remove HM's hippocampus, a part of the limbic system that was associated with emotion, but whose function was unknown. At first glance, the operation had succeeded. HM's seizures virtually disappeared, with no change in personality, and his IQ even improved. But there was one problem. His memory was shot. Besides losing most of his memories from the previous decade, HM was unable to form new ones, forgetting what day it was, repeating comments, and even eating multiple meals in a row. When Scoville informed another expert, Wilder Penfield, of the results, he sent a PhD student named Brenda Milner to study HM at his parents' home, where he now spent his days doing odd chores and watching classic movies for the first time, over and over. What she discovered through a series of tests and interviews didn't just contribute greatly to the study of memory. It redefined what memory even meant. One of Milner's findings shed light on the obvious fact that although HM couldn't form new memories, he still retained information long enough from moment to moment to finish a sentence or find the bathroom. When Milner gave him a random number, he managed to remember it for 15 minutes by repeating it to himself constantly. But only five minutes later, he forgot the test had even taken place. Neuroscientists had thought of memory as monolithic, all of it essentially the same, and stored throughout the brain. Milner's results were not only the first clue for the now familiar distinction between short-term and long-term memory, but showed that each uses different brain regions. We now know that memory formation involves several steps. After immediate sensory data is temporarily transcribed by neurons in the cortex, it travels to the hippocampus, where special proteins work to strengthen the cortical synaptic connections. If the experience was strong enough or we recall it periodically in the first few days, the hippocampus then transfers the memory back to the cortex for permanent storage. HM's mind could form the initial impressions, but without a hippocampus to perform this memory consolidation, they eroded like messages scrawled in sand. But this was not the only memory distinction Milner found. In a now famous experiment, she asked HM to trace a third star in the narrow space between the outlines of two concentric ones, while he could only see his paper and pencil through a mirror. Like anyone else performing such an awkward task for the first time, he did horribly. But surprisingly, he improved over repeated trials, even though he had no memory of previous attempts. His unconscious motor centers remembered what the conscious mind had forgotten. What Milner had discovered was that the declarative memory of names, dates, and facts is different from the procedural memory of riding a bicycle or signing your name. And we now know that procedural memory relies more on the basal ganglia and cerebellum, structures that were intact in HM's brain. This distinction between knowing that and knowing how has underpinned all memory research since. HM died at the age of 82 after a mostly peaceful life in a nursing home. Over the years, he had been examined by more than 100 neuroscientists, making his the most studied mind in history. Upon his death, his brain was preserved and scanned before being cut into over 2,000 individual slices and photographed to form a digital map down to the level of individual neurons, all in a live broadcast watched by 400,000 people. Though HM spent most of his life forgetting things, 
he and his contributions to our understanding of memory will be remembered for generations to come. Welcome back. So now you understand why the hippocampus is a critical area in memory encoding and memory retrieval. So here is yet another sketch from Dr. Kandel's paper that he published in Science in 2001. It was kind of an invitation um, article that he wrote after he received his Nobel Prize in 2000. In this paper, he summarizes his research strategy and how he and his colleagues, and he gave credits to many of them, uh, arrived at the findings that he had made. So here then is a description of some of the pathways that he worked on in the rodent hippocampus. So there are three major pathways, each of which are capable of long-term potentiation. You already are familiar with the term long-term potentiation, which we discussed at some length when we analyzed the biochemistry and function of the glutamine synapse. So here we are again. We have the perforant pathway that um, makes a synapse connection in the dentate gyrus. Uh, from the dentate gyrus, uh, we have a connection to the through the mossy fiber pathway to the CA3 field, the pyramidal cells of the CA3, much studied in hippocampal uh, research and then the so-called Schaefer collateral pathway that connects the pyramidal cells to the CA3 region with pyramidal cells in the CA1 region of the hippocampus. And as you can see, um, early and late phases of uh, long-term potentiation occur uh, in the hippocampus just as they did in uh, Plusia. So potentiation, of course, is the hallmark of learning. Next slide. And here is some of the some of the uh, wiring, the intercellular wiring diagram that relates to this. Some of the players you are familiar with, such as uh, cyclic AMP. However, uh, NMDA, of course, now plays a major role. The Schaefer collateral pathway. Um, utilizes a glutamate as a transmitter. You can see the NMDA receptor and the AMPA receptor here, which both in their own way lead to uh, triggering of the postsynaptic neuron. Uh, Chymodulin dependent calcium kinase being a very important um, effector, effector really in these cells in addition to cyclic AMP. Other regulators occur Eventually, you see the production of uh, brain-derived um, neurotrophic factor, which we have encountered many times before in our talks, leading to the production of uh, synaptic uh, um, dendritic spines and new neuronal connections. So again, the same principle applies, um, signal transduction, cyclic AMP or calcium uh, mediated signal transduction leading to activation of a set of genes leading to the production of brain derived neurotrophic factors and others and then a remodeling and reconstruction of the synapse which then is the encoding, the encoding which is the engram of the memory. The modification of the synapse or the modification of a collection or assembly of synapses is the memory trace, nothing else. This can be proven later and in subsequent talks to this when we talk about implanting false memory and uh, how to isolate an engram in living animals, we can prove this beyond a reasonable doubt. So here is the story then. Um, you see here other factors, regulators, 
such as EPB beta that Dr. Kandel has been working on recently. He believes that there are proteins which have prion-like properties. Prions are proteins that tend to self-aggregate or identify partners in the cell that they like to aggregate, aggregate with because of um, structural um, complementarity. And Dr. Kandel believes that this kind of aggregation, prion-like aggregation uh, in cells, may also be a mechanism that recruits long-term retention of memory. Once these things are aggregated, they don't come apart. So in fact, they are like a permanent record of an event that has taken place in the cell. But much of this in later talks. The next slide. Finally, uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about how to teach a mouse a memory. So here you have a rodent uh, in a training uh, camp, so to speak, in a cage. Uh, there is a sudden onset of a sound called the conditioned stimulus. Then, unfortunately for the little animal, there is a foot shock called the unconditioned stimulus. Now, after some time, you don't even need to apply the foot shock. The sound alone will lead to freezing, illustrated here, of the animal. Anticipating the shock, it will just lie down and freeze and pretend to be dead. So that then is a form of learning. You remember that, sure enough, when the sound, when your bell tolls, the foot shock is sure to come. Next, next slide. And so uh, Dr. Kandel and his group uh, utilized this uh, uh, mechanism to show that protein kinase, the translocation of protein kinase, is critically involved in uh, this kind of learning. So as you can see here, when they use a genetically engineered mouse that has a deficient form of protein kinase, this mouse has a decreased response to the unconditioned stimulus. I'm sorry, to the conditioned stimulus, the sound. It just doesn't care. So it has not learned the association between the, the bell and the foot shock. Now, on the right-hand side of the panel, it talks about place cell map stability. And I need to introduce you brief, briefly to the notion of place cells. It was discovered uh, some years ago, um, and the 2014 Nobel Prize in Medicine was given to three people um, dealing with this that in the mouse hippocampus there are cells that only fire when the animal is at a certain spot in an enclosed place. In no other place will, will this neuron fire. And if you let the mouse run around in the cage, uh, different cells will fire and eventually compose a pattern of firing consisting of equilateral triangles. They are totally tiled together, like the mouth, the mouse knows math. It knows Pythagoras. It knows how to most efficiently encode the space that it's in. So these are place cells. In a sense, they are memory cells encoding one specific item, namely the position of the organism in space. And you can see that with the um, genetically engineered deficient protein kinase, which is unable to trigger the uh, gene transcription response, that the place cells response is also attenuated. Now, you see here a um, video um, under C, place cell stability. And I'd like for you to highlight that video into your browser and watch it to give you uh, some additional information. Next slide. OK, so where am I? Uh, spatial memory decoded for mice, no math. So I'd like for you to watch this video quickly, which is uh, very intriguing and uh, explains in great detail 
how the mouse hippocampus encodes um, a situation position in space and how your brain knows where your car is parked in the parking lot. I'll see you at the other side of this video. <laughs>
where they think uh, the flag had been stretches out in exactly the same way that the place cell firing pattern stretched out. It's as if you remember where the flag was by storing the pattern of firing across, across all of your place cells at that location, and then you can get back to that location by moving around so that you best match the current pattern of firing of your place cells with that stored pattern. That guides you back to the location that you want to remember. But we also know where we are through movement. So if we take some outbound path, perhaps we park and we wander off, we know because of our own movements, which we can integrate over this path, roughly what the heading direction is to go back. And play cells also get this kind of path integration input from a kind of cell called a grid cell. Now, grid cells are found again on the inputs to the hippocampus, and they're a bit like play cells, but now as the rat explores around, each individual cell fires in a whole array of different locations, which are laid out across the environment in an amazingly regular triangular grid. And if you record from uh, several grid cells, shown here in different colors, each one has a grid-like firing pattern across the environment, and each cell's grid-like firing pattern is shifted slightly relative to the other cells. So the red one fires on this grid, and the green one on this one, and the blue one on this one, so together, it's as if the rat can put a virtual grid of firing locations across its environment, a bit like the latitude and longitude lines that you'd find on a map, but using triangles. And as it moves around, the electrical activity can pass from one of these cells to the next cell to keep track of where it is, so that it can use its own movements to know uh, where it is in its environment. Do people have grid cells? Well, because all of the grid-like firing patterns have the same axes of symmetry, the same uh, orientations of grid shown in orange here, it means that the net activity of all of the grid cells in a particular part of the brain should change according to whether we're running along one of these six directions or running along one of these six directions in between. So we can put people in an MRI scanner and have them do a little video game like the one I showed you and look for this signal and indeed, you do see it in the human enterinal cortex, which is the same part of the brain that you see grid cells in rats. So back to Homer. He's probably remembering where his car was in terms of the distances and directions to extended buildings and boundaries around the location where he parked. And that would be represented by the firing of boundary detecting cells. He's also remembering the path he took out of the car park which would be represented in the firing of grid cells. Now, both of these kinds of cells can make the place cells fire, and he can return to the location where he parked by moving so as to find where it is that best matches the firing pattern of the place cells in his brain currently with the stored pattern uh, where he parked his car. And that guides him back to that location, irrespective of visual cues like whether his car is actually there. Maybe it's been towed. <laughs> but he knows where it was, so he knows to go and get it. So beyond spatial memory, if we look for this grid-like firing pattern throughout the whole brain, we see it in a whole series of locations which are always active when we do all kinds of autobiographical memory tasks, like remembering the last time you went to a wedding, for example. So it may be that the neural mechanisms for representing the space around us are also used for generating uh, visual imagery so that we can recreate the spatial scene, at least, of the events that have happened to us when we want to imagine them. So if this was happening, your memories could start by place cells activating each other via these dense interconnections, and then reactivating boundary cells to create the spatial structure of the scene around your viewpoint. And grid cells could move this viewpoint through that space. Another kind of cell, head direction cells, which I didn't mention yet, they fire like a compass according to which way you're facing. They could define the viewing direction from which you want to generate an image for your visual imagery so you can imagine what happened when you were at this wedding, for example. So this is just one example of a new era, really, in cognitive neuroscience, where we're beginning to understand psychological processes like how you remember or imagine or even think in terms of the actions of the billions of individual neurons uh, that make up our brains. Thank you very much. Okay, welcome back. We'll be coming to the conclusion of this talk, but I want to give Dr. Kendall kind of the last word. So he says, I started this essay by pointing out 40 years ago, at the beginning of my career, 
I thought that a reductionist approach based on the use of a simple experimental system such as Eplusia might allow us to address fundamental questions in learning and memory. That was a leap of faith for which I have been rewarded beyond my fondest hopes. Still, the complexity of explicit memory is formidable and we have only begun to explore it. We as yet know little about the molecular mechanisms that initiate or stabilize the synaptic growth associated with long-term memory. What signaling molecules lead to the cytoskeletal rearrangements during synaptic remodeling? How do they relate to the molecules that control synapse formation during development? Now this was written in 2001. Now in 2016 we know a whole lot more. So we will follow Dr. Kandel uh, down the road from his 60th birthday forward in the next uh, lecture or so. But we will also uh, invoke other players um, at MIT and other places in the world that have used advanced techniques of optogenetics and others to revolutionize our understanding of <clears throat> memory, uh, memory encoding and memory retrieval um, the idea of false memory, the manipulation of memory, the sensitivity of memory on recall to modification and corruption. Uh, a huge theme as memory is kind of at the core of uh, what we believe to be ourselves. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed this video. We'll see you soon in the memory fields. Thank you.